We're talking this morning with Dr. Gretchen Onstadt with the University of Washington School of Public Health. Dr. Onstadt, tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the expertise you have regarding uh, some of the work you've done in environmental health, like hydraulic fracturing or water. Well, I'm an environmental uh, analytical chemist, and I've had about 18 years of experience uh, analyzing contaminants in water and air. My specific expertise is in drinking water disinfection and water treatment processes, and there are several stresses on water resources when it comes to hydraulic fracturing. What's some of the re research that's happening at the University of Washington in regards to environmental health science and fracking? So currently I'm collaborating with Peter Rabinowitz. He was previously at Yale, and while there, he and colleagues um, initiated a community health assessment survey of a, a community in southwest Pennsylvania that has a really high density of natural gas wells. And uh, they recruited households that were all on, um, on well water in that area um, and submitted a, a health assessment to those uh, residents. And what kind of results did you find from that health assessment? So they asked questions uh, specifically about uh, target organ systems that have been uh, associated with those types of symptoms um, in areas that have high amounts of gas wells. Uh, these include like respiratory symptoms or uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, neurological symptoms, dermal, um, like skin irritation, those types of things. Um, what are the sources of contamination from the hydraulic fracturing process? What are some of the potential health effects? So there are three main sources of contaminants. Uh, one is just the methane gas itself that uh, can be accidentally or intentionally released during the fracking process. Another is the fracking fluid itself that's used, which is made up of uh, hundreds of different chemicals. And lastly, there's the wastewater that is produced uh, during the frac fracking process. And that has uh, the composition of the fracking fluid, but also of uh, contaminants that can be found in the, the shale layer, the, this, this natural geology um, that can be in that wastewater. I think the fracking fluid is, is probably the, the one of most concern because um, when they looked at the contaminants that are known in the fracking fluid, many of them had health effects uh, like skin irritation, um, respiratory effects, or, or uh, nervous system effects, or even uh, endocrine disrupting compounds mm -hmm. that can affect reproductive development. Um, what are some of the issues. How do people and animal come in contact with these contaminants? Well, they get into the water, the air, the soil. Um, air in particular um, can be contaminated just by the methane release. Um, also, there are uh, volatile compounds um, and uh, nitrogen oxides that are precursors for ground level ozone. Mm -hmm. So that those levels can be respiratory irritants. Um, there's crystalline silica sand that's actually used as a propant to keep those cracks open to release the natural gas. And the workers at those sites can be exposed and develop silicosis. Um, there's also diesel particulate matter from the diesel trucks. It requires two to five million gallons of water for every hydrofracking uh, event. And so you have a lot of diesel particulate matter that's produced from that. Um, and then also, if the wastewater is stored on site after um, it's produced, then there are volatile compounds that can be released uh, into the air and affect the community's health. In terms of water quality, um, you can also have a little bit of a solubilization of the um, of the methane, there's the water also is very high in salt content. Uh, heavy metals like arsenic or lead could come from that geological layer, and also radioactive compounds uh, naturally occurring in that shale layer. So these are all potential um, contaminants that that workers or uh, residents could be exposed to if they drink that water. And there are some um, particular challenges to uh, treating that water. It can't just go to a regular wastewater treatment plant. It has to be um, treated in a special plant or uh, injected in deep wells. 
Dr. Onstad, how do you identify the research needs for your studies? So it really depends on the community itself. Um, it has been found that uh, the, uh, these types of health symptoms that I listed earlier um, have been associated with communities that have high uh, density of, of gas wells. Um, and what, uh, what are some of the results you've discovered from doing all this research into uh, the, the, these gas wells and into water? So, uh, so far, Peter Rubinowitz and his colleagues have found an association between uh, dermal symptoms and respiratory symptoms in people that are within one kilometer of, uh, of gas wells, um, and also uh, certain health symptoms for dogs as well. We're just starting to look at um, the, the water quality contaminants um, to see if there's any association between the contaminants and uh, closeness to, to gas wells, but we, we don't have those results yet. These are fascinating results. Is there any way for the public or for state legislators to gain access to this information? So the studies from Peter Rabinowitz are published uh, in the scientific literature, one in environmental health perspectives um, in 2014 and one in the Journal of uh, um, Environmental Science and Health in, in 2015. Um, so they can access them that way or contact us at the University of Washington. Great. Well, on behalf of the National Conference of State Legislatures, we want to thank Dr. Onstadt for being with us this morning. Thank you.